Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview Kaggle Grandmaster and data scientist at H2O.AI Rohan Rao. I feel there is a lot to cover here, so I might miss a few things about Rohan, but I'll have his Wikipedia page. Yes, Wikipedia page, LinkedIn and Twitter linked in the description in case you want to connect with him or follow him. Rohan is a Kaggle Grandmaster in the competition tier and a data scientist, as I mentioned, at H2O.AI. He has represented India not just in data science but also in Sudoku and puzzles. He is a seven-time and current national Sudoku champion and the first Indian to be ranked in top ten at the World Championship in 2012, where he secured the eighth position. Currently, his world rank is 17th. and he's secured two podium finishes at asian sudoku championship and he's a five time national puzzle champion with his current rank being 44th four time and current <laughs> times natural sudoku champion in this interview we talk all about his journey into data science into data and numbers rohan is a numbers guy we talk all about his journey into the world of competitive sports both on and off kaggle we also discuss one of my favorite themes that i got to witness uh, from him at the kaggle days talk that he had given again linked in the description called on and off kaggle we talk about his on kaggle versus off kaggle journey in his off kaggle journey we discuss his data science journey and on kaggle we discuss how his approach to kaggle has changed over the years how it's evolved and his current thoughts on the platform and tips and advices of course to newbies like myself we also discuss his recent eighth gold medal on his profile and his second uh, position finish on the ashray great energy prediction 3 that's the title of the kaggle competition solution uh, bringing of course the eighth medal to his profile I'd like to thank everyone for sending all of their questions via the AMA. I've tried my best to include all of them. And again, a quick plug: this interview, uh, including all of the future ones, will have proper data science term checked subtitles for the non-native English speaking audience. So, if you're watching on YouTube, please enable the subtitles for a better experience. And if you have any other suggestions for how I can improve the interview, please do send them my way. I'd be most happy to include it. also the blog post for this will be released soon so you can subscribe uh, to my mailing list or you can check out the link of the blog where this will be posted again this is a special interview release that thanks to h2o will be released on h2o's u h2o.ai's youtube channel in case you want to check out all of the under, other interview series that has been going on you can find the link to the playlist in the description of this podcast and video Without further ado, here's my interview with Kaggle Grandmaster and data scientist and Sudoku champion Rohan Rao. Please enjoy the show. Hello Rohan thank you so much for joining me on the interview series and specially agreeing to the AMA section Sure Sam thanks a lot for inviting me to your channel and I'm more than glad to be giving this interview with you It's a privilege to have another person whose name when you google a wikipedia page returns so it's a privilege to have you on the show um talking about your background you have a masters in stats 
and you've been working in machine learning space right since your post grad studies could you tell us how did you get excited about data science or machine learning and confirm or deny if the stats background was your secret weapon to becoming a grandmaster so i think the the story starts uh, a little before my masters so i think after my 12th grade you know most of my batchmates friends they were all doing either you know they were getting into engineering or they were <laughs> getting into you know medical or going or trying to become a doctor and so when i sort of you know reflected back as to what i really like or what i really enjoy doing uh, it was math so i really i really like math i like numbers since a very young age you're a numbers guy <laughs> i am a numbers guy yes it's it's on my profile as well so i just felt you know instead of um, you know just doing what a lot of other people are doing i wanted to pursue something that i really like i really enjoy which is the reason uh, for my bachelor's i decided to do uh, a, a simple bachelor of science where i majored in uh, statistics so my courses there primarily were uh, economics maths and stats and i think during those 3 years uh, it really made me understand there is so much more to math than just the high school math that you are taught <laughs> uh, it's it's a much more vast broad field broad area and uh, that that's when my uh, passion and interest really grew in statistics uh, just to pursue it further uh, i applied for the masters course uh, at iit bombay uh, i cracked the entrance exam and i got through so those those two years of masters uh, uh, really helped me get a lot of theoretical understanding of uh, statistics and you know a lot of the algorithm a lot of the algorithms that are there a lot of the uh you know base uh, knowledge and information uh, about uh, about the field so in terms of whether it's my secret weapon uh, i can very easily say it's not okay right so there's 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 a lot more to to data science than just you know the pure uh, statistics uh so when i started out i think my statistical background helped me pick up things in data science much faster and we are talking about like 2013 so data science was just sort of just starting to become you know popular and people were getting into the field you know doing some research building algorithms yeah and this was the time where like there was no xg boost <laughs> the kind <laughs> of forest was like the new hot thing so so while uh, my course did not have uh, too much of practical application uh, it, it was primarily and completely theoretical so it, so it gave me a lot of the base understanding and the ground concepts of how a lot of these elements that we work on in data science today they work so obviously you talk to anybody in the data science field it's really about you know being hands on actually yep. building stuff actually doing things writing these algorithms trying out you know the wildest of ideas that you get so so statistics is is a piece but it's it's not a secret weapon <laughs> okay it, it's <laughs> theory confirmed it's more like an add on you know that that i was fortunate to have a formal education on it uh, but it is something that i think any person out there can just spend you know 3 or 4 dedicated months uh, just reading and studying about it through so many uh, online uh, resources and material that is there that's a very honest insight uh, did you also have a practice of coding or did you pick it up while in college or after college how did that journey start for you Uh, about data science uh, about coding specifically because you had a theoretical background in stats and then i assume you had to also pick up code to apply stats yes so uh, so my course uh, my masters course did not have coding at all i mean it may it may surprise people but yeah we we did not probably write more than 10 lines of code across the two years oh. it was pure theoretical so so in fact you know uh, one of the things i very clearly remember uh, in 2013 after i passed out someone uh, asked me you know what do you think about python mm-hmm. i said yeah i think it's a really nice snake <laughs> and 
that that was my actual reply i i didn't okay. know there is something <laughs> called you know python which is a programming language right so uh, i think it began with my first job uh, i was fortunate uh, to be placed in a data science consultancy firm called 64 squares they are based out of uh, pune in india so so there uh, i had a great mentor and boss uh, shashi godbole uh during those years 2013 uh, he was among the uh, top indians on kaggle okay and uh, he was the one who you know introduced me to kaggle sort of exposed me to a uh, lot of the current happenings in data science uh, and as part of my work uh, in that company i had to you know pick up a programming language uh, to be able to actually you know implement the solutions and the algorithms and sort of hand it over to our customers so that's where then i started uh, picking up you know coding uh, i learned r first and even as of today it's my favorite language you're still a fan <laughs> i'm still a big r fan i think uh, data dot table is uh, very very easily and clearly my favorite library of a programming language of all time <laughs> okay so so yeah i i picked up r uh, i think during my first entire year uh majority of my work was i mean everything was in r uh, slowly there was uh, you know development happening community getting built around uh, python pandas became quite popular uh some of the clients that we were uh, talking to had requested you know to sort of give solutions in python because they had their tech stack in python and it's sort of more easily integrable into their systems so that's when uh, you know we in within the company we started uh, learning and picking up a bit more about python i started applying some of those on kaggle and then you know with practice with more exposure you just improve and get better at it got so it that's that's how i sort of picked up my my coding skills it was from scratch okay now before we talk about your journey because there are a lot of themes to unpack here you currently working as a data scientist at h2o.ai could you tell us more about the problems that you're working on the products that you're working on and what does a day in your life off kaggle currently look like so uh, h2o as a company uh, we have you know wide range of uh, products libraries so it's a pure machine learning based platform where we have a bunch of open source tools we have just some some closed source products and i think one of the uh, the beauty of you know h2o as a company is it it has a good mix of you know building and enabling data scientists around the world to use uh, the h2o's uh, ecosystem and the products Uh, in a very generalized fashion and democratizing ai yes, as we call it it goes with the motto of the company which is you know democratizing ai so the challenge to build you know let's say a library or a product which is as generic in nature as possible so that it caters to a wide variety of use cases with the complexity of building really vertical or industry specific solutions using these you know global tools so i think that mix and that challenge to be able, to be able to you know combine both to be able to implement both optimize both uh, i think that's a great uh, uh, that's a great balance uh, uh, on the on the work front that i have mm-hmm. and i enjoy you know working on both sides both both aspects of it and i do work on the product side uh, building these you know universally accepted and used products as well as trying to you know optimize them to build really solid accurate very industry specific uh, solutions and the other uh, big advantage uh, of a company like h2o is being very industry agnostic you get to you know understand talk to and experience so many different and wide applications of machine learning across so many different industries so it's it's almost a new learning experience with every customer even for you yes even for me even oh. even now <laughs> okay so i mean it just it, that is what gives me the kick so and that's what i enjoy i love doing 
Awesome. Now, coming to your journey, I'll talk about your non-data science journey first, uh, because during my research for this interview, I found three themes about your career that really stood out to me. Sports and competitiveness, they are like pretty visible on your Twitter, your love for sports, love for numbers, obviously, and logic. You're a top rank holder outside of data science as well in Sudoku, which I think you found by chance and became turned out you, you're really good at it. Could you tell us more about your journey on these things outside of data science, your journey in puzzles and logics and numbers? And how do you balance this lifestyle of data science and non-data science work? Yeah, so uh, since a young age, um, you know, I've always been fascinated uh, by numbers as well as sports. I've, I've, I've played a lot of different sports. I just, I, I enjoy the, the physical aspect of it. And in fact, uh, in today's world, uh, I'm glad that, you know, I had so much of exposure and opportunity to play so many different sports and pursue some of them. So one of the key aspects, and you mentioned that point very well, which is competitiveness. And I think it comes from uh, my school days where uh, I, was, I was a chess player. So I've played uh, chess at, you know, the national levels. I have my international rating as well. Okay. And uh, I, I think that really, I really understood how to, how to optimize yourself in a competitive environment, right? How do you push yourself? How do you make the most? How do you work hard to be really good at something and actually show it and display it? And the thing that, you know, pushed me or the thing that uh, uh, gave me the maximum uh, happiness, right, is let's say at the end of, you know, a, a chess match or, you know, I've played caroms, I've played badminton, I've played TT. It, it's that thrill of, you know, winning <laughs> where you really feel that, oh, you have finally, you know, achieved something or you have hit a goal. Obviously, you don't always win, uh, which is also one of the other key aspects of it. So I really learned well how to deal with failures. Obviously, I mean, nobody is perfect, right? You would have, you would have wins, you would have losses as well. Sure. Now to be able to, you know, accept that loss, to be able to go back, you know, understand why, why did you lose or where did you go wrong and sort of improving yourself. I think that cycle uh, really, really worked well. And I was able to, you know, optimize that over the years, sort of learning from a lot of these different competitive environments, winning some, losing others, and just, <laughs> you know, improving, improving yourself uh, day by day. How did you manage to keep your, keep your peak performance under pressure? Because I remember reading about it in your blog post uh, about a, uh, championship i think where you missed the flight and there were some visa issues turned out you reached south korea 28 hours late and yet you did pretty well in that championship so any tips or tricks for handling the pressure not just of that but also like of the outside world yeah it's it's not easy i mean this is <laughs> this is something that has come uh, over many years of experience right so i th i think if uh, the the pressure and uh, you know just the the expectation the the wishes of doing well uh, it is a little difficult and hard during the initial stages of, of anything you know whether whether it's a sport whether it's kaggle whether it's work you know it's it, it's anything uh, it, it's just you know experience and with time uh, as and when you know you learn that oh, it's it, it's it's not the end of the world Right? There, there will always be another time. There will always, always be another chance. Like nobody's perfect. And uh, I think the the most important point is whenever you face these incidences or scenarios, it's more about learning from them and ensuring that if ever that happens again, or even if something similar happens again, you know how really well to deal with it. So even if you know, I look back at, let's say my Sudoku career, which uh, it, it's it's spanned more than a decade now. Uh, I started 
I think my first Sudoku competition was August two thousand five. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember there was years. school days. Yes, yes. I was in my my tenth standard, my tenth grade. Okay. And uh, there was a small uh, city level Sudoku competition in uh, in Mumbai where I used to live. Uh, I did not know how to solve a Sudoku then, and. Uh, but i just liked numbers i liked math i used to do a lot of uh, crosswords and puzzles in general but i but i had never solved a sudoku then okay so just one day before before that competition uh, my father came to me and asked hey rohan there is this sudoku competition do you want to go for it and my response was i don't know what's a sudoku wow okay <laughs> so he gave me the newspaper and he told me Hey, here's an example. Why don't you just read and just try to solve it? So, so I took that newspaper and I was solving the Sudoku. Uh, my dad went and bought me uh, an entry ticket for the competition. Okay. So, and the next day was was the competition. So, I I just went for it. I mean, I I solved that one single Sudoku the previous day. i just sort of understood the rules and got a sense of you know how it works and uh, the next day in the competition i stood first so, okay <laughs> so standing first in the city like suddenly out of nowhere of the thing uh, you never knew about <laughs> yes i mean I, i didn't know about it the previous day so i just sort of sat and thought thinking oh, okay maybe i'm good at this so and in that point of time um, i i was quite into chess so i was playing a lot of chess going for tournaments so with with sudoku suddenly coming in it was hard to balance both and mm-hmm. that's where you know one of the key aspects of my life which i like to share <laughs> yes, which is uh, it is about sacrifice you know it comes in a lot of different ways uh, whether it's you know management of time whether it's you know optimizing the 24 hours that you have optimizing the set of things uh, you could do to make uh, you know the maximum impact uh, i think one of the hardest decisions i've ever taken in my life was during that time where i just completely stopped playing chess okay until today i've i've never got back fully uh, in chess but the primary reason was i realized that to be really good at something you have to sacrifice and give up other things it was just not possible for me to you know pursue both and try to be good at both so i sort of just gave up chess i took over uh, sudoku full time i really enjoyed it it was something new uh, and i was doing well uh, i worked really hard i practiced hard and uh, i have been fortunate to uh, you know perform well at the at the nationals and and it gave me a great opportunity to uh, represent india at the world championships for almost 10 years now to so, remind the audience again this mature decision making happened in your i think 10th grade as you mentioned so during in that age group when i don't even remember what i was doing <laughs> yeah it would be uh, 10th grade 11th grade yeah i mean it was uh, i i did speak to a few people but uh, yeah the the decision the decision was hard it was mine i can imagine uh, obviously you know looking back uh, in hindsight you always feel oh it was a great the dots decision. connect yes you can always connect the dots backwards but uh, it's it was hard at at, at that time <laughs> Now, coming to another interesting journey of yours, Kaggle, which you started after you joined your first job in data science. So, like people usually aim for the opposite, use Kaggle as a proxy to join data science. Can you talk about your initial days of Kaggle? Did you also have an amazing first few competitions like with Sudoku? And was Starts helpful in the first competition? This question comes from. the fact that many people think they absolutely need to take a statistics course before jumping on kaggle is that true so uh, i would uh, differ from you a little bit uh, i would still say uh, my kaggle and my data science journey sort of started in parallel together okay, okay. and so i think my my first job uh, which was at the data science consultancy firm that's when i really got into uh, data science and 
that's when i started kaggle as well and i think it's great to you know work on both in parallel and uh, in fact in one of my recent talks uh, at at the kaggle days bangalore i specifically talk about you know on kaggle and off kaggle off and how it's important to you know balance and work on both aspects of it so you you do learn a lot of things on kaggle and honestly and i'm sure any kaggle grandmaster or master would agree that there are absolutely no prerequisites to join kaggle and to become good at kaggle right it's the only okay so the only prerequisite i would say is you should be willing to invest time that's exactly <laughs> that's the only prerequisite so so obviously like with time with practice you know with uh, understanding questioning uh, reading learning uh, you do get uh, you know a lot of the understanding about how kaggle works uh, what are the things you can learn and benefit from doing the competitions now obviously there are you know there are data sets there are kernels you can do visualizations you can yes. just write kernels or you can you know just share things on the forums <laughs> copy and start also yes. yes there is absolutely no dearth of information and you know content out there so i keep telling people uh, the kaggle forums in some ways are they are like a gold mine of of information and even today you know when i reflect back i think a large majority of a lot of the skills that i have and a lot of the, th- the things that i've learned and i know uh, comes from you know spending time uh, on kaggle uh, so that being said uh, there are important aspects of data science to learn and know even outside kaggle uh, just you know a couple of uh, short key examples is so on kaggle you get uh, ready made data sets <laughs> and in in a in a corporate you know work environment you are in charge of you know figuring out what data do you have how do you prepare the data set how do you get the right accesses how do you build those data pipelines so that is one major uh, piece component which is very important which uh, you generally only get when when you work uh, you know on on a project outside kaggle like on your own or within within the company uh, the second is productionizing so on kaggle you are not really required to you know productionize your code you know have it run in real time fetch the predictions you know integrate it with another tech system or product uh, but this is something that's probably one of the primary reasons why a lot of data science projects fail uh, in the industry because uh, it it's not very easy to you know productionize some of these algorithms models and uh, have it running and functioning as you know the business expects it to so so balancing the two is uh, very critical very important and uh, my strong suggestion would be that you know given a choice you should spend time on both which is what i have managed to do across the years okay talking about your initial uh, competitive days on kaggle did you also have those wonder moments on kaggle how was that journey like for you and what competitions did you enter did it change over time yeah so i think uh, because of my you know competitive spirit and background uh, i got hooked on to kaggle immediately <laughs> <laughs> you know <clears throat> i think anything that's uh, very sporty or which is sort of objective in nature it's a sports is all about it, it, the evaluation is objective like generally there are points and at the end whoever has the most points or whoever plays the best game they they, they sort of emerge the winner it's not a human based evaluation so i found kaggle that way right so kaggle it's about you know you're given a data set you're given uh, an evaluation metric do whatever you can and optimize it to the fullest yeah right obviously with with some constraints obviously the the public and the private leaderboard concept uh, is really great to to ensure that uh, the models uh, do perform well and generalize better but uh, you know just the the competitive part of it is what uh, 
I really got hooked on to. I started out uh, doing competitions where, you know, I just spent time reading through forums, just exploring the data and trying to understand. Because and and I'm talking about like 2013, 2014. There were no kernels at that point okay. of time, <laughs> right? So I think a lot more had to be done from scratch than uh, now. The, the way it is now where you know you can just jump onto a competition you have five great amazing public kernels so you already have a great head start yeah so so earlier it was it was a little bit more uh, there, there was a little bit more of hard work required do you think that was better or uh, the situation now is like in a challenge in itself because everyone has that equal head start yeah i think uh, I think there are pros and cons either ways. Uh, and the, the biggest pro is, uh, you know, you get a head start and uh, you, you learn a lot more, like irrespective of what people may feel. I think, you know, the kernels are a great way of, you know, showcasing a lot of different ideas, different models, algorithms. Um, and obviously the downside is a uh, lot of the people tend to miss out on the thought process that went behind some of these kernels. Yeah. Right? Why were certain features engineered or created? Why were these models used? Or how were the, you know, the classic example is a lot of the modeling kernels have just the set of parameters. So you miss out on how did the person come up with those parameters? Hmm. Right? So these are some of the things that a lot of people take for granted and hmm. they don't fully uh, get a chance to you know explore some of those aspects of it so yeah there are there are like pros and cons of 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 either way okay uh, but in terms of competitions um, i generally do one competition at a time uh, okay. i started out like that and i think even now i generally tend to like just focus on one uh, the main reason being um, i i want to take back as much as possible from the competitions, right? So obviously performing well uh, is one goal, one wish, uh, but the larger, the more important uh, aspect is from every competition, there is so much of learning that you get, uh, which is true even today. Like even today after, you know, I think mean, six years of gaggling, with every new competition, there are still like, two, three new different things that, you know, I learn, I take back with me. Okay. So that has been my primary objective uh, of working uh, in competitions. Uh, doing well is obviously it's just, it's, it's a cherry on the cake, right? So when you do well, obviously you get excited about it. It's a side uh, project. It. Yes, absolutely. And it sort of motivates you to, you know, do more, do better. And I think just that competitive spirit in me helped me pursue it over so many years. I think uh, you mentioned this during our offline conversation in the Kaggle Days meetup. Do you still subscribe to every single Kaggle forum? I know you already mentioned it's a great learning source for you. Do you still read every single discussion? So during my first maybe two years, I did. Okay. I used to subscribe every forum every single uh, message on every Kaggle. single yeah D during my first two two and a half years yeah probably up until the time i became a grandmaster okay uh, i mean that's no reason for stopping but <laughs> i think <laughs> I, I just got uh, really busy with work mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think 2017 yeah 2017 was uh, i think the year i was least active on Kaggle, uh, and since then i think it brought about a slight change I started doing lesser competitions and spending lesser time uh, on Kaggle. Uh, some of my work projects uh, was also very interesting, which is the reason, you know, the, the balance level, it had a slight shift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my off Kaggle sort of became slightly more interesting, important. So, so yeah, it, it, it switched a bit in the middle. Uh, but now, uh, primary, I think uh, I mainly tend to focus and read uh, just one or two of the most interesting competitions or ones that I'm most uh, excited about. Okay. But the primary reason is uh, more because of, uh, you know, management of time. Uh, there are a lot of other things that I, I want to do and pursue. 
uh, and Kaggle, one of my goals was like to become a competitions grandmaster. Okay. So after achieving that goal, uh, you know, the marginal benefit of uh, spending more time decreased for me personally. Uh, so that's the reason uh, I've reduced it over time. You already proved your space on Kaggle. So you're doing that now in your workspace. Yeah, uh, I I like to, you know, ha- set some targets for myself um, uh, in, in anything, uh, try to reach it or achieve it. And uh, once that is done, you, you move know, on to the next, move on to, you know, something else, try out. So I, I in general, I like exploring new things, uh, just trying out different ideas, different hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> I Sudoku has been long, but uh, yeah, I, I still, I really enjoy it. So that's why I, I still do it. Talking about time, I this is your message that I became a huge fan of. And to quote you, Kaggle is my sec- favorite second full-time job, but it comes at a sacrifice. So many people have asked this question from the AMA. How do you balance time spent on competitions with life and work? And I'd also love to know how the shift has happened over the few years. How do you better manage your time once you like got a hang of Kaggle? Yeah, that's that's the golden question, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've been asked that question uh, quite a few times, and uh, so I have uh, thirty six hours in a day. Okay, got it. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Obviously, I have just four hours, you know. So, <clears throat> so one of the things uh, that I do, uh, not necessarily it would work for everyone, but uh, you know, I, I did realize that to be really efficient and to to do as impactful work as possible, you need to choose. Right? You need to make those choices and sacrifices. So w- one of the experiments that I had, that, that I had done, and I, I still follow it uh, even today, is I make a... Uh, a sort of a, like a master task list. Okay. So it could be, and and it's not for a really large duration, something like let's say one year or six months. Okay. Right? So usually I I usually do it for three months or six months, but you could do it for even a year. Okay. So let's say you have a set of n tasks, and these tasks should uh, should uh, include everything right from you know, sleeping, eating, uh, working, playing, anything, like anything and everything that you would do in your life or that you would want to do for, let's say those six months, Mm -hmm. you list down those tasks for every task associated, you list down an expected time. So for example, let's say if it's sleep, right? So you would be doing, let's say eight hours of sleep every day. Right. So you multiply it by, let's say six months. So you get that many hours of sleep. Similarly for every task that you have, uh, I, I, I put down my expected number of hours that I want to spend on it. Right. So I have these uh, expected number of hours. Now it's about prioritizing these tasks. So now I order these tasks, which are the ones that I are most important to me. So obviously like eating, sleeping, you know, some of these things have to be right on top. They are non-negotiables. Yeah. But after that, when you really have choices, right? So maybe there's a choice between, let's say, working on a casual competition for three hours versus, right? So some of these uh, choices, decisions, you need to prioritize, right? So I order the end tasks from top to bottom in terms of the most, uh, priority or the most important tasks. So now once I have the tasks ordered, I look at the cumulative sum of the expected hours. Some starts terminology. (laughs) Yes. So you keep uh, uh, adding uh, the expected number of hours of each each task until you hit that number, which is your total of six months, right? Or just to give some buffer, it could be your total of five and a half months. Because obviously there would be certain, you know, activities or events where you can't really know or predict, but the most important piece is here. So after you come up with that cutoff, 
let's say you know you have let's say 200 tasks and you reach your cut off at let's say the 75th task mm -hmm. the 125 tasks which did not make the cut mm -hmm. it's really about discipline right to be able to have the discipline of sacrificing those 125 tasks for that period of 6 months i think that significantly helps and benefits it's uh, not necessarily it would work for everyone uh, i think people have to try out different ways different things but uh, i mean it's it's fair with everyone right so everyone has 24 hours and it's really about how you manage and optimize those 24 hours for yourself yeah. so this has worked really well for me it's it's given me a lot of time to spend on kaggle sudoku other interests hobbies but it has come at the cost of other things that i have sacrificed so but yeah i mean i'm willing to do it so if if other people are then they should definitely try it out it's also about having the discipline to be honest to yourself when we set goals professionally we devoted a huge chunk of time and as the motivation cycle goes down the hours also go down and <laughs> the planning go, goes down the water drain so that's where i think the discipline part of it comes into the picture yeah discipline is it is important because uh, there would always be times when you know you have uh, like let's say you know a group of friends decide to you know go for a picnic or a trek or an outing yep but if if you if you haven't allotted that time in your you know priority list you have to be able to say no at that point in time which is which is difficult yeah uh, it, it does take some time some effort to to even make those decisions uh, but i think um, yeah so at the end of 6 months uh, you would realize that uh, okay fine you gave up on you know these five things or these seven things but there were another five things that you achieved which which otherwise you wouldn't have so i think that's the that's the you know balance pros cons that uh, you have to accept and and build on that talking about your kaggle journey i'm sure it took a lot of sacrifices but there was a lot of genius behind it as well uh can you t this again is the topic we've already discussed about on kaggle versus off kaggle people often talk about kaggle is in data science but i rather want to ask you how has what you've learned on kaggle impacted your professional life in a positive or negative way um definitely i mean th there are no two ways about it uh, okay so so i think the the number one the number one thing that you know most kagglers are really good at is i think for any problem statement across any industry they would be able to very quickly you know build a solution and build like a 90th percentile solution or maybe 95th percentile solution <laughs> in within like 24 hours right and just just that ability to understand you know given like a particular business objective how do you structure that 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 machine learning problem and you know most most of most of the kagglers have a lot of automated and ready made scripts and you know just dump dump that uh, you know data set or model uh, dump the, the the flow into your scripts get an output and uh, you know then work around like optimizing it tuning it you know there are a lot of these nitty gritties that i think kagglers are really excellent at so like things like let's say overfitting or leakage uh, you know or doing target encoding kind of features very very efficiently and properly now these are some things that uh, i think outside of kaggle it's very hard to you know really explore or understand or even get some of these ideas so i think a lot of the best feature ideas that i have got uh, have been like through kaggle features right through kaggle competitions which i have gone and implemented in the like, actual real world life uh, problems and projects so so a lot of these uh, technical aspects uh, i think i have really learned well on kaggle which i've been able to uh, you know implement and like, okay. actually even productionize it so 
uh, coming to teaming up aspect of Kagel, most of the beginners seek teaming up on Kagel for obvious reasons. However, for you, I think this is one of the few like highest numbers I've seen. You've done sixty percent of the competitions by yourself, and medaled, of course, in a large few numbers of them. Uh, why did you decide to be the lone wolf in all of these competitions? Yeah, I I clearly remember at least during my initial days, uh, I used to only do solo competitions. Uh, I, I think it comes from my background. Uh, even Sudoku is an individual sport. Chess is an individual sport. You know, I'm used to being an individual fighter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To put it that way, right? So I, I remember even when uh, you know we used to play uh, cricket. I used to barely, you know, take singles and doubles. <laughs> when <laughs> okay. when we used to play badminton, I used to never play doubles. <laughs> so I, I just somehow like never liked that, you know, dependency on another person uh, for no fault of theirs. But uh, just I think uh, my nature was such that uh, uh, I liked uh, I like to build things and I like to do take well ownership. myself. Right. Yes. Take ownership. Uh, I like to, you know, see something from start to end uh, with as less help as possible. Right. So it would not be not take any help. Obviously, when you are stuck, when you are facing issues, you go. You you definitely go to people, ask for help. And in turn, I think whenever anyone came to me asking for help, I tried to sort of help them and showcase uh, a, a solution as as best as I could. Uh, but over time, I realized uh, Kaggle is different. Like data science is different. So practicing and learning data science, I found was significantly better and faster in teams. Right? So I, I think I finally took the leap of faith and I joined you know a couple of teams for some competitions. And I realized just you know that uh, just like data I mean, especially on Kaggle, it's it's not just ensembling models. It's also it's ensembling ideas, it's ensembling people, right? So just having two different people build like the same model is still way more powerful, way more interesting than let's say one person building two different models. There's a lot more diversity. Like the way I do things is very different from the way someone else would do like the same thing. Where, and that's where you know I learn. Okay, maybe there's a better way of doing something. You get access to not just their brains, also their code, also their thought process, and also their models, which directly helps the leader. But but that's not the most highlighted portion. Yes, absolutely. You you get you get access to to a lot of these. Uh, it just adds a different dimension to your thought process and to the work that you're doing. So that's when I started realizing that uh, you know yes there is there is a lot of uh, advantage and benefit of working in teams. Um, unfortunately, I realized this after getting four solo goals. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, I think since then, uh, yeah, the the I think many of the other competitions have, have started teaming up, and I think in recent times uh, a lot of the competitions have been in teams. You and also, I think, also going forward, I will be, I will be doing more of team competitions. You also quoted teaming up is the most underrated aspect of Kaggle during Kaggle Days event. Oh yes, I, I clearly remember that. So it was, uh, it was more like uh, you know a moment of realization even for me. Okay. Because even I, I used to refrain from teaming. So for me, the thought process was, hey, you know, how do I optimize? A competition to get most points, let's say, right? And okay. uh, with every yeah, with every additional team member in your team, uh, the number of points that you get uh, reduces right? for the same rank. For the audience, uh, this, these earlier, points push you up the competition's ranking, uh, which I think you were aiming for. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so my my objective was like a little different, but uh, then I realized that. Uh, I was missing the aspect of the probability of getting a higher rank, right? So that also increases when you team up, yep. right? And uh, I think now with the the new Kaggle scoring system, I think that came about two years or three years back. 
for every additional member uh, the decrease in points is is lesser mm -hmm. so there is more incentive to team up and you just you just learn better if you have a higher chance of uh, you know finishing well and uh, i think ultimately and on average uh, it's it's just a win win like you just win i mean you get you you perform better you learn more uh, even I, i think sharing itself is uh, another big form of learning so when you share with people you know others comment they share their ideas views so you learn things about your work and yourself as well yeah whereas if you do something individually there's like nobody evaluating your work uh, like there is no you know cross checking that's happening there's no verification so you miss, you miss out on some of these these aspects of it okay now uh, coming to your recent feat uh, congratulations on the eighth gold medal on your profile uh, before we talk all about your second position finish on it's called ashray great energy prediction competition can you help us set the stage about what was the challenge here and uh, what made you sign up for it what made you accept the challenge yeah so the the ashray competition uh, so i think ashray stands for uh, Uh, the american society of uh, heat h r refrigeration air conditioning engineers okay so it, it's it's sort of like an association of uh, of uh, these folks and and it's 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 a global association i think across more than 150 or 140 countries mm -hmm. and i think their primary objective is just to you know enhance improve um energy improve like uh, just the way uh, some of these resources are being manufacturing uh, have been uh, manufactured consumed uh, and just sort of enabling to have a better environment mm -hmm. right so it's it's primarily in the uh, in the energy sector okay uh they hosted this competition on kagel where Uh, the primary objective was to to predict the uh, consumption of energy of buildings so i think the data had about uh, it had 16 sites so sites so every site was uh, thanks thanks to the leakage we know that every site was like an educational institute or a university and uh, each site had like a set of buildings so they could be classrooms or halls or maybe a convocation center or residential blocks right so there were a lot of these buildings in each university and uh, there were four types of um, uh, energy consumption meters so i think the biggest one was electricity and the other three were uh, there was hot water there was steam and there was chilled water okay so these were so essentially the task was to predict the consumption of these four meters across these different uh, buildings across sites so okay. these sites were spread out globally so they were across different countries and different types of buildings so the the primary data was uh, uh, the historic meter readings uh, of these buildings uh, along with uh, some metadata information about the sites and the buildings like uh, you know the the weather data about the sites like what was the air temperature the humidity the cloud coverage the dew mm -hmm. and uh, specifically on the buildings it was uh, there was data on the year of construction of the building what was the square feet area of the building what was the type of building yeah so broadly this this was the data set so it was a energy forecasting sort of competition okay uh, for me the objective was um, uh, i i just, i haven't been very active on kaggle last one two years so i thought uh, you know this was it was an interesting data set uh, it was also a large data set uh, which was one of the reasons Uh, i decided to give this a shot okay. and um, uh, yeah i mean that's 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 the reason i sort of joined okay 
uh, could you tell us your first go to steps as a proxy of like generally speaking also about kaggle competition but first go to steps when you got started on this competition how did you approach the problem yeah so i think for any kaggle competition uh, the first thing that i do is i spend one complete week on almost any kaggle competition uh, by myself Okay. just to get a complete understanding of the data like an end to end understanding of you know the problem statement the data set the kind of features what's the evaluation metric uh, for me the goal is you know at the end of that one week i should be able to answer any question anyone asks about that data set right so having that mindset i sort of dig deep into the data and get like a very deep understanding of what what the sort of data is and then comes you know the more uh, <clears throat> uh, the the more process oriented part of it which is okay then you start you know building your pipeline of modeling how do you set up the right validation framework uh, build some baseline simple models to get a sense of you know what's the accuracy rate that you have or what's the what was the evaluation metric uh, where do you sort of stand with a very generic set of features you make some make a few submissions to the leaderboard to get a sense of the directionality between you know your validation with the public leaderboard uh, and then finally it's you know really going deep into optimizing like tuning hyperparameters ensembling teaming up uh, figuring out external data sources Uh, trying a bunch of other crazy feature ideas doing <laughs> some small small hacks <clears throat> so yeah this it's it's generally this but i think the uh, the most important piece in all of this is uh, the initial one week that mm-hmm. is on every competition uh, just getting a deep sense of the data to be able to answer any question that that is put forth to me for beginners like me it might take longer than a week so if you're feeling intimidated by that i can confirm it takes much longer for me to be able to have that comprehensiveness of any data set yeah yeah i mean it's it's one week now right so after 6 years i'm saying it's one week so obviously during during my initial competitions yeah it, it, it used to be longer right? okay. so you do you do spend more time Uh, you know figuring out how to look at things you may not be able to cover all the aspects of it and over the years uh, a lot of the you know the ways i explore data i have automated it so it, it obviously with time you get better you get faster you know and and i still feel that every person should do this themselves right so there are a lot of automated scripts out there there are a lot of you know these eda kernels and uh, these automated visualizations but i still think if you know every person can build their own like toolkit of the things or the way in which they would like to see and explore data i think it's it's, it's a great experiment and investment to have like steve jobs had a gut feeling for good products subjectively speaking kaggle grand masters have the gut feeling for most of the data sets i think that's why they every one of us looks up to uh, kaggle grand masters so much <laughs> i mean it it still comes uh, with experience so it's not really like i'm Definitely. sure there are a lot of uh, strong you know masters as well out there yeah. who are doing who are doing really well in competitions and it's just a matter of time uh, before you know even they will be grandmasters just a matter of a solo gold <laughs> yes. yes some people are waiting for their solo golds uh, but it's really about uh, you know with time and experience you get these gut feelings okay. it's not gut feelings that you know i have been born with or you know grandmasters are born with you don't it's, see the data and visualization start happening inside of your yes, head right you, away it's not that you know you you see the data and oh you get you know, the numbers the start coming yes. up around your head <laughs> no exactly you know oh this is going to work <laughs> it it's 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 it, it's that's not how 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 it works okay. it's random like that it's really about you know with experience and trying out and automating you you get a better understanding of the data 
we're all familiar with your amazing results from earlier. Can you tell us this, if you found this problem easy, so to speak, and relevant to any previous experiences from Kaggle or off Kaggle? So uh, I think among the uh, various competitions or data sets I've worked on, this would be amongst the easier ones uh, in the sense that uh, the data set was fairly simple, uh, structured, easy to understand. Uh, I think the only, there, there were two major challenges. Uh, one was uh, the data size was uh, quite large. Uh, so even Kaggle kernels was not very sufficient. Um, the second was uh, just the uh, the way this particular data set was structured. So for time series kind of problems like this one, where you know you are forecasting uh, for future uh, for the future, uh, this data set had uh, three years of data uh, from beginning 2016 to end 2018. Uh, but uh, the train data was only one year. It was 2016 and the test data was two years. Right. So it's, it's contrary to most other data sets and problem statements that you would see where like the training data would be few years and your test data would be one year. Right. Maybe the training data is let's say one year and you have to forecast for two weeks or a month ahead. Right. So this, this particular data set was unique in that way. Okay. Could you tell us more about your team? How do you generally pick your teammates and your teammates in this competition? And when you have this multiple team of awesome people, how do you distribute the ideas and workflow and track all of the hundreds or thousands of experiments that are being run? Yeah, so uh, while looking for teammates, uh, primarily I look at uh, two things. Uh, one is credibility of the users. Like they should have like spend some time on Kaggle, you know, doing some competitions or it, it could even be interesting kernels or some good discussions. Right? So I, I avoid uh, teaming up with absolute beginners and novices uh, because there is a slight chance that, you know, they may not be able to uh, give their best or they may not know much about Kaggle and, and it would just not be fair to either of us. Uh, the second thing uh, which I do is I try to team up with uh, people or teams that uh, sort of have a reasonably decent score and uh, it's a little um, uh, just it's, it's it's just to optimize it's a personal optimization that I do to, okay. to sort of have a higher chance of finishing well uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure like a lot of people do that so it's 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 a combination of these two. So for this particular competition, um, I think when I posted the the half and half kernel, uh, which became quite popular, uh, and in fact uh, the the original author of that kernel uh, is another Kaggler who goes by the username KXX. Okay. So he shared that kernel in uh, in R, and I I thought it was like a very great simple unique idea which was beating a lot of the you know complex feature engineering based kernels out there so i just ported the code in python and shared it so so i think that that kernel became popular and uh, uh, oleg is a german who was working on this competition uh, at that point of time and he was doing well i think he was in the top 10 at that time and uh, he asked me if you know I would be willing to team up, and uh, I I joined his team, and then we started doing well. We worked together for close to a month, and then towards the end we needed uh, a little more push uh, to perform well. So we, we added two more team members. Uh, one is Anton, another German, and uh, Light, who is a Chinese. So all, all I think all all four of us. Uh, uh, we spent quite some time on the data set on the problem statement we we picked out we picked up different aspects of it so while uh, you know uh, oleg anton they were primarily focusing on the boosting based models so that's when i decided to uh, focus a little bit on the neural network uh, and i helped set up the the ensembling flow 
uh, when light came in he had did his light gbm and he tried to optimize a cat boost right so we sort of uh, you know just picked up different components uh, different types of models and uh, specific to this competition i think early on we realized that uh, feature engineering is not going to help too much so we just decided to you know on some well and diversify as many different models as possible okay and when we realized that you know data cleaning was the key uh, i think close to 60% of our time on the entire competition went towards you know just cleaning the data okay uh so i want to scream this one thing for the audience i know it's a huge misconception but the previous i think you mentioned this at the analytics with your conference but all of your seven gold medal solutions were trained on a simple laptop not a huge aws server i really want to scream this for the audience can you share your hardware setup for this competition uh, did you again do it on your laptop or did you do it on a pc server yeah so so i don't know how it happened but <laughs> yeah ironically <laughs> or coincidentally uh, all my previous uh, seven gold medals uh, all those solutions uh, i've built on my uh, not just laptop it's my 4 gb macbook air so yeah it's a very lightweight uh, simple machine just 4 gb ram so and i think i think most of those competitions uh, uh, either they have some clever feature engineering or uh, they do uh, some clever uh, data processing and simple you know on some link like nothing too complicated nothing fancy so i think that's where uh, that's the reason why uh, they they worked on the laptops and uh, they did they did perform well uh, specifically for this competition uh, the data set was large uh, but uh, you know based on our solution and and i've shared a very uh, detailed write up on the kaggle forum i think our base it will be was, linked in the description yes so the, the base was um, uh, building models for every site so since we had 16 sites uh, the entire data set could be broken down into 16 sets of you know training data and test data so that was a bit more manageable so we we could use you know the kaggle kernels uh, for the site specific models but to build a model on the entire data set uh, which we did use as part of the ensemble models uh, even the kaggle kernels with 16 gb ram were not enough so so i'm not sure the exact uh, specifications uh, my teammates used but i think when i when i ran uh, you know the codes on my machine uh, it was a 64 gb ram machine so it was just a vm on on gcp okay so i use a- gcp and aws interchangeably for for competitions okay uh, i have a slight preference towards gcp but uh, okay. i think both are they have their pros and cons okay so yeah what computing resources would you recommend to someone who's aiming for the gold uh, region uh, in a reasonable amount of time so why not try a 4 gb macbook air <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's still possible in 2020 yeah i mean why not like why not it's 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 a little bit more difficult now uh, i would concede and i would uh, accept ad- admit that Uh, but i think uh, you know i used to take it up as a challenge for myself saying that you know i have this 4 gb macbook air what's the best i can do using this laptop right so i think during those days um, i used to just have this as you know a challenge for myself okay so even some of the other competitions uh, you know on analytics vidya and other other uh, websites i i used to just challenge myself so let's just stick to my laptop let's see uh, what's the best i can do and i think what that enabled me to do is uh, which i have also mentioned in my uh, uh, grandmaster panel discussion at h2o world so my favorite thing is to build the single most powerful optimized model right so to get one model which is like super optimized and very very accurate uh, it it gives me the key. very uncommon on kaggle again for yes. the audience i want yes. to show nowadays uh, yeah i mean you can just 
uh, on some will blend lot of different models algorithms really fast as well so maybe maybe the the value add of that uh, is is reducing with time but i still think uh, because i used to do that uh, i think my my ideas and the way i think about you know features or think about you know squeezing the most from a data set uh, i think that significantly improved okay uh, but yeah as of now i think a lot of the more recent competitions uh, they have uh, quite large data sets and uh, it is be- becoming uh, important to have uh, larger you know systems and resources uh, in some ways uh, kaggle has solved that by providing you know 16 gb ram uh, kernels which you can run 10 or even more simultaneously yeah so so they are providing that but yes you do find often that even 16 gb is not enough and uh, my recommendation would be to sort of have your toolkit set up on the cloud if if you're going to invest the time also invest into a machine <laughs> yes yes i mean it's it's part of it's part of the investment and and it's also a learning process when you really understand and learn how how a lot of the algorithms and the software aspects of it they sort of marry the the hardware components you know with gpus becoming so popular and now maybe even tpu is coming up and you know maybe other things in the future so it's good to have that knowledge and understanding as well yeah now as we all know like 20 to 30 experiments are tried maybe even more in a kaggle competition a lot don't work how do you decide which uh, to continue pursuing which to end in context of this competition or generally speaking and any uh, how do you come up with intuition about why didn't any experiment work yeah so it's a i think this is a combination of two things uh, one is your validation uh, just having the best and the right validation framework uh, is very important and uh, that should lead to simplify some of these decisions right and if you go through many of the past uh, kaggle top solutions there are a lot of different ways in which you can set up your validation framework right and it's not only your local validation so you can do out of sample validation you can even do cross validation you can do you can even check your public leaderboard you can do a combination of all this right so a lot of people um, you 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 sort of have confidence of like a feature or a model or an idea if it shows sort of improvement in at least two or, or basically multiple places right so that's when you are more confident that oh a new idea or a new feature is working well uh, the second is a bit on intuition uh, sometimes you know it's not always possible to you know locally validate everything sometimes there are certain aspects of which which uh, you know you know which is there in your test data but you cannot bring in into your training data set so some of these tweaks have to be done outside and manually uh, specific to ashray i think uh, it was very difficult to set up a good validation framework and the primary reason being uh, the unique uh, the unique structure of the data set then you have one year of training data and two years of test data so we just stuck to uh, group k fold validation uh, where we grouped on month so we just as you we just uh, ensured that uh, you know different months were in different groups and we we stuck to that uh, overall it seemed aligned with the public leaderboard and uh, intuitively we felt that uh, the public leaderboard should be at least close to resemble the private leaderboard so we trusted the public lb more than uh, the the local validation okay. but the other major component was the leaked data mm-hmm. uh, some of the sites the target variable was publicly available so some awesome kagglers you know scraped the data set and uh, in, in in the right sportsman spirit shared it on the kernels so i have credited them in my post as well uh, so that that data we used for doing some of our validation because uh, that data is also present uh, in the private test set 
uh, Kaggle did remove it from the final results, but it was good to validate some of the ideas, models, weights that we had. Okay. Yeah, now, and in terms of uh, uh, managing all of this, uh, uh, some of the people who have worked with me would know that uh, I have this famous Excel sheet. <laughs> uh, I maintain for uh, a lot of the uh, work, competition, even outside Kaggle, uh, many of the projects that I work on. Uh, so I maintain this sheet where, you know, I record everything. Okay. Every every idea that was tried, what were the scores. You're a numbers guy. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy. And, uh, you know, being a data scientist, uh, it should be a data-driven decision. Why is it <laughs> important? Uh, you have to weigh both of them. So I like to like, you know, just sit back, look at, you know, the 20, the 30 experiments that were tried, sort of understand what were, what were their movements, how did they perform, and then sort of use that to take the final call or the final decision. Okay. Now, uh, coming to your final uh, competition solution, if you could give a very high level overview of it, of course, I'll have it linked in the description for those who want a complete understanding, but if you could explain it in a simpler fashion uh, in this podcast. Yeah. So my, so our solution, um, it, it was primarily uh, built around uh, uh, Oleg's light GBM setup. So he set up a very nice script where, you know, for, for every uh, site, uh, we built uh, uh, a light GBM model. So we were able to optimize models for every site. So there were 16 sites, so we built 16 models. And even if you remove the leaked ones, uh, we had one site for every model. Uh, then to Ensemble, uh, we built uh, uh, one model for every uh, building type and meter combination. Okay. And uh, we also built uh, models using the entire training data together. Uh, the model types that we used were XGBoost, LightGBM, CatBoost. Um, we also build uh, neural networks, but only for the electricity readings. Uh, okay. We found that uh, neural networks were not performing well for the other meters. So we didn't uh, ensemble it for the other meters. Uh, and finally, uh, so, yeah, so the two major components outside the modeling is the, the initial data processing, uh, the data cleaning rather. So there were a lot of outliers in the data. And uh, very initially, we found that just removing these outliers uh, gave a significant boost to the performance. And I think if I remember right, there were uh, 1,449 buildings. And I think at least two of us went through the data of every building manually okay. and cleaned it. Yes. So I think a significant amount of time uh, was spent just on you know cleaning the data. I believe you're also a fan of cleaning the data, dropping features as much as you can, dropping data as much as you can. Oh yes, Econ, that, that's my secret sauce. It's <laughs> not be public. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So yeah, I mean one of one of my uh, favorite uh, you know data processing steps is dropping features. And uh, I've even won competitions just because of, you know, dropping uh, noisy or unimportant features. So I guess just, contrary it, to what people do on Kaggle, because people would lo love to add as much features as they can usually. Yes, it is quite counterintuitive. And in fact, I've had, I've had arguments with people saying <laughs> that, uh, hey, no, you know, you, you need the models to be more clever to figure out what's important and not. <laughs> Well, I mean, I do agree with that, but I mean, I, I still like, you know, dropping features and it's not just about accuracy. So it's also about, you know, if you have, let's say thousand features where even if maybe 300 of them are not very useful, uh, your code runs much faster with 700 features rather than thousand. So you can run more experiments, you can do things faster. And that's where for me, the benefit and the motivation comes from. So, so yeah, in, in, in this competition, we dropped the outliers. And uh, so what this resulted is in a more accurate model, but because we dropped uh, outliers and all the outliers were uh, a zero valued rows where the target variable was zero. Since we were dropping them, 
we were we were artificially inflating the mean of the target okay uh, which is the reason uh, our final predictions we post processed it and multiplied it by a factor of less than 1 to bring down the mean to the actual expected true mean okay so so broadly uh, uh, this th- this is the sort of flow of our solution uh, so in fact uh, we the final leaderboard was uh, announced a few days back uh, and we did we did check our submission even without the leak uh, i mean without the post processing okay. and uh, it still performs i think it's good enough for second or third okay so i think overall we had a really solid model and uh, primarily that came from uh, uh, the the data cleaning that was done and i think uh, most of the credit goes to uh, oleg for that i think he spent the most time and he figured this thing out and i remember during our initial discussions uh, we quickly realized feature engineering uh, is a little risky uh, because it's hard to validate and it may just add noise uh, and even without uh, feature engineering we were getting very similar scores so i think all our final models have like just the very basic set of 20 or 25 features okay did you end up using r as well for this competition or was it python so it was primary primarily python okay. uh, but our uh, ensemble script is in r so all the data processing uh, the models uh, every models uh, you know optimization everything is in uh, python Okay. Uh, it's only the last uh, ensembling piece uh, that is in R, but that's very easily doable in Python as well. Just you know, towards the end, we wanted to do things uh, really fast and you know try out. And since R is still my you know my right hand language, my first language, I just switched to R and got things done faster. Okay. Now uh, I'll f- share a few questions from the AMA one by one, and maybe you can go over them because there are a lot of them. Uh, sure. what was your feeling around all of the leakages that has happened during the competition yeah it's it's unfortunate uh, this i think this is something that uh, the organizers should have uh, at least realized or made an attempt to solve for before but uh, you know even with that being said uh, full credit to all the people who you know scraped the public websites and you know shared the data on the forums i think it helped made the the competition clean and uh, at least it gave it became a level playing field right so i think a lot of people were afraid that oh people who are good at web scraping they are going to win this competition <laughs> and honestly even i had that fear right so so i mean i'm glad and uh, uh, i'm happy that uh, the the leaks were shared Uh, and finally you know towards the end uh, i think the uh, kaggle team also uh, they took a good decision that they they removed the sites that were leaked from the private test set uh, just you know to be fair and safe because they didn't want uh, solutions that were heavily exploiting the leak uh, to be the top solutions so i think that was that was a good decision uh, it's just a little unfortunate that uh, it's sort of like an ad hoc requirement that came to kaggle like in between of a competition so it took quite some time for them to finalize everything and you know share share the final results but yeah i think uh, overall at the end uh, probably with the, the leak happening i think it's they made the best out of it okay uh, how did you train on the massive data any tricks or tips for doing uh, or just dealing with such massive data in general just get more ram computing <laughs> i mean resources and uh, computing power is is getting cheaper uh, i think um, specifically for uh, kaggle you would want to do things faster quicker and i think it's easier to you know just get uh, a larger system uh, i think there's more uh, benefit than uh, to spend a lot of time like super optimizing your code while obviously you can do the latter as well and there is learning in it um, so even uh, i think uh, the kernels only competitions on kaggle uh, i think that's what uh, forces you to do that right? so you can't really 
build really large complex you know compute intensive or time consuming features or modules right so they give you that constraint that what can you do in 16 gb ram with uh, how many other cores are there and within 9 hours of run time right so there are these competitions where now uh, forcing you to uh, you know figure out ways in which to get the best output or solution with constraints on resources Got so you. considering you already have this constraint in some competitions for the other ones i think you should just go berserk and, you know explore these high ram machines and actually uh, sort of see the the value and the impact and the benefit that uh, they make now uh, as you mentioned you spent a lot of time cleaning the data uh, did you automate was that automated and uh, do you have any tips again the person is asking about how do you do it in increments maybe you run small experiments or was it a full scale experiment for you the whole uh, data cleaning process so let me break this into two so i'll talk about data cleaning for ashray and i'll talk about uh, data cleaning in general so uh, specifically to ashray um, we did try uh, a couple of uh, you know simple rule based data cleaning scripts and uh, i think a couple of them are also uh, shared on the uh, kaggle kernels so they do work they do work uh, reasonably well uh, it works for about 98% of the cases it does identify the right outliers but i mean if if you're working on a kaggle competition you would want 100% right so and 1449 buildings uh, it's not too much uh, it did take i think maybe five full days to go through every building you know plot it identify those outlier observations again for seasoned kaglers not newbie kaglers <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no i mean this is this is fairly doable this is okay <laughs> there were not too many of them <laughs> like i mean so if you plot uh, the observations of a building uh, it's very easy to like pinpoint and uh, uh, sort of identify that oh these are the outliers okay so so i think that's that was fairly doable uh, it, it just took uh, time but what i think it enabled us uh, instead of having 80% 98% of outliers removed we got to like the exact set of 100% of outliers that we actually would have wanted to remove but yeah i mean i think if this was like a production system where you have to update it like every day or every month every week obviously this is not feasible then you would go for the automated scripts okay uh, uh data cleaning in general um i would say i think it's it's a little bit more of an iterative process so i think with experience there are a lot of basic and repetitive uh, data cleaning ideas or data preprocessing ideas that uh, that are there and uh, the general the general uh, uh, you know approaches to try out each of them Uh, validate it locally or locally with the leaderboard, and then sort of take the combination or the set that works the best. Okay. Now, a question about your solution: Did you try to build uh, time series models with CNNs and LSTMs for Ashray? And if you did, why didn't you include those in the solutions? So we did. Uh, in fact, uh, I have also publicly shared a kernel that uses Profit. so i did try uh, lstm as well as profit uh, but i think both of them um, uh, performed significantly worse than the boosting models uh, and also we we also did try to ensemble them with a very small weight but it barely uh, gave any improvement okay. so we decided to sort of scrap that idea but i think again uh, the reason why these models don't work is uh, due to due to the size of the training data so it, it's just one year of data so it's hard for time series models to really understand let's say yearly trends right or yearly patterns um or even patterns within a year because within a year you have like only one set of data points so i think that's the reason why uh, these models don't fit really well and uh, it it didn't really work out for us and most of the top teams uh, don't have any time series based models that are used okay 
now uh, i know that you have personally started pushing a lot of uh, sharing towards the discussions and kernels also which you also did in this competition which is like slightly contrary because usually the top winners don't share while they are competing they don't give away that much knowledge this question is will you continue doing that in future competitions also or uh, did this just happen by chance in this competition actually i disagree with you on that i think uh, <clears throat> in many of the past competitions uh, many folks amongst the top teams have shared uh, while the competition has been going uh, and in fact you know i used to also wonder oh, why are they really sharing like is this the secret sauce is this what's going to uh, you know really is this what is required to you know perform well but i think the motivation for you know these people and uh, for me in this competition uh, it was not so much about and none of these you know codes or ideas uh, have been shared in the most optimal way like so even if you look at the kernels i have posted they are just they are just the building blocks right that enable people to you know use them and for them to pick up and optimize for themselves so so yeah there are, there have been times where you know really optimized code has been shared and uh, it has received a lot of backlash uh, but uh, personally if you look at uh, you know my kernels or even some of my discussions i don't think i have uh, really shared much about you know my optimized set of models or uh, we, i don't think i even shared uh, my cv or validation framework or scores Right, so the the kernels are primarily just building blocks okay. that uh, enable uh, mainly beginners and newcomers to you know quickly pick up and try out things for themselves. I'm sorry, I'm the new kagler who hasn't experienced as many competitions, so I rely on the prevailing emotion that experienced kaglers don't share as much. <laughs> no, they do, they do. In fact, uh, you have also interviewed uh, CPMB, and uh, I mean, irrespective of where he is on the leaderboard. He's he's always sharing a lot of interesting stuff, and and in fact, I have uh, learned a lot from a lot of these top kagglers who you know who have shared ideas, who have shared codes. So I thought uh, you know for a change, <laughs> if you really want to you know give back to the community, so that was uh, my little motivation of doing it. Another plug is an interview that I did with. Uh... Kaggle legend Jiba Gilberto, who shared a leak in a competition and ended up performing really well on that one also. So do check that out for yes. the audience. Could, the final question from the AM is: uh, How many total hours were put into the entire process from agreeing to the terms to selecting the final models throughout the time you were active? Um, for for the Ashley competition? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, for this one. so i started i think beginning november and okay. the competition ended uh, mid december mm-hmm. so that's about 45 days i probably would have spent about on average 3 to 4 hours every day okay so that's about 200 hours 200 man hours and we had like four people in our team so maybe the team effort totally was maybe 500 hours yeah maybe between 500 and 1000 man hours yeah okay okay it's it's of course some genius and a lot of efforts or a lot of genius and a lot of efforts as well <laughs> yeah it's a combination it's a combination of both now uh stepping back from kagel uh, you have witnessed kagel over the few years since 2013 i i was in high school back then so i didn't get to experience it but i assume the platform has changed a lot Uh, can you name any favorite change or any favorite feature that they have added over the over these years favorite feature uh, i think favorite feature would definitely be the kernels the okay. notebooks you know not not just about uh, uh, you know giving a platform to share it but also about uh, you know giving resources to the competitors yeah. because ultimately you don't want you know the best solutions to be built by the competitors who can only afford you know larger systems it's really about uh, sort of nullifying that aspect of it and democratizing it again yes yes exactly democratizing uh, the resource power of it and 
uh, enabling more people to you know come onto the platform and uh, like literally like anyone can just connect to kaggle using any machine now yeah use the kernels to solve uh, solve the problems so i think that would be my my number one favorite uh, feature that they have introduced okay compared to the 2013 days yeah <laughs> <laughs> you've also been former number one on analytics with yeah you also uh, achieved many great uh, results on crowd analytics uh, platform uh, what are your thoughts on competitive data science outside of kaggle any preferences there yeah i think uh, i i was one of the few ones who have been active on uh, analytics with the crowd analytics kaggle since uh, more than 5 years uh, and i think these these platforms are uh, really good in uh, you know understanding uh, data sets optimizing models building solutions with a really quick turnaround time uh in terms of uh, you know these particular uh, platforms in general uh, they are the, i think each is different uh, in in a particular way so uh, i mean just for example analytics vidya has uh, doesn't just do competitions they do like a lot more of you know blog posts and uh, they have a lot, lot of educational content uh, their primary focus uh, has been uh, in the uh, in the indian market Uh, being an indian company and they are uh, clearly like the biggest uh, data science community uh, of india yep so i think that they have done some great work and in fact i have also mentioned this uh, before that uh, i think the last four or five competitions on analytics with them they have been exceptional like the quality of the data set uh, the stability of the metrics Uh, just the organization and the final outputs the solutions uh, so so i think it's just it's just getting uh, better with time uh, on kaggle i mean they have a lot more variety uh, they have uh, internationally the largest community uh, they have a wide mix of you know different problem statements and uh, uh, I, i think uh, globally the the kind of learnings that you would get from these platforms it's is just incredible and i think the the best part about these is it's 100% free yeah so i mean i i don't see any reason why someone not in data science would not be on these platforms way to now this has been a amazing interview full of amazing advices but i'd like to ask you for a final advice to beginners who are just starting their machine learning journey and how can they motivate themselves to make the sacrifice as you call it yeah so it's a trick question <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's 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 tricky to have one single answer uh, but but i think the answer for this really needs to come from the individuals themselves Right, so internally, so I mean, I have shared some of the things that has worked for me. Right, so other people, other grandmasters, you know, they would have their share of experiences, but there would be, you know, certain aspects which are like common or consistent across uh, these. Uh, but primarily, it's it's really about uh, you know not not feeling afraid of you know going deep into. these competitions or these data sets trying out stuff and uh, i remember someone telling somewhere but i don't remember where it was so no idea is ever a bad idea right so no no feature idea or no modeling idea is is, is really a bad idea mm-hmm. and as uh, we discussed and you mentioned that you have to try 100 things and maybe five would work yeah so if if you if you do not try 100 things you will never find those five that work and to try those 100 things you have to put in that amount of time and effort so it it, it does come at at the cost of uh, you know invest investing this this time and uh, putting in that number of hours but there is learning and and if if anyone wants to be good 
at machine learning or who wants to build a career in data science they they have to they have to spend time do things hands on you know try out a lot of stuff and that's how that's how you grow and you become good at it and in fact i think we are at a generation where you know there is so much of content freely available so anyone can do it sitting anywhere in the world they just need access to one machine and internet uh, so it's it's just super easy to be able to you know pick it up do things and and grow so that would be my simple <laughs> <laughs> advice <laughs> before we end the interview can you share the secret behind your name wo pani on i think sudoku leaderboards and kaggle as well so that's that's been a secret for many years and it will continue remaining a secret okay uh, i do plan to uh, you know share it's a nice it's a nice story okay uh, of what that name is and how i came up to it uh, but there is there is still a few more years to go before i can publicly share that but it hopefully, is coming. it is going to come sometime <laughs> hopefully it might be revealed on the podcast so subscribe if you haven't <laughs> thank you so much rohan before we end the call what would be the best platforms to follow you i'll have your twitter and linkedin linked in the description any other platforms that you want to mention yeah so i would say twitter twitter is the best place to catch hold of me uh, email would be another okay uh, so these these two places generally uh, i'm fairly active awesome. uh, linkedin not so much uh, i just keep it to my personal professional network awesome thank you so much rohan for joining me on this series and for all of your contributions and representing india not just in data science but also in sports at the national levels and best wishes to you for your future sudoku competitions and also data science bowl competition cool uh, thanks so much sam for inviting me to the chat and data science show uh, i mean it was good i i have been following your show and i've been seeing all of the interviews so it's great to be now uh, you know one of the the episodes thank you so much and i hope your viewers also uh, like this 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 interview i'm very sure uh, we all will enjoy it as much as i did <laughs> cool Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.